Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone and welcome to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast produced by Ellen Marcel, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Let's get started. Welcome back to the show and a very happy new year. I'm Marie, usually the host of Self-Improvement Atlas and Reloscope, the personal science and relationship science insights podcasts. Now, unfortunately, Dina couldn't make it today, so I've decided to have her back as always and help her out. And in this episode, we're talking about play therapy and there are several ways to approach this with your kids but understanding the fundamentals is key to making it work and what better time to start learning about this than during the new year so today we're speaking to registered play therapist Brenna Hicks to guide us through this hi Brenna it's lovely having you on the show hi thank you thanks for having me Thank you for coming on the show. Now, before we get started, I'd love to know a bit more about your role as a play therapist in building a safe and positive relationship between parent and child. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So it's really an interesting scenario. I talk about this a lot when I train other play therapists because we're in a very unique situation as a play therapist because our child is the client but parents are typically the customer, if you will. So they're the ones bringing the child and learning from us and paying for sessions. So it's a really unique scenario. And so there's a really special bond that takes place between the play therapist, the child and the parents. And we actually call that filial therapy. So that is a form of play therapy and filial from the Latin for family. And we look at it as the therapist, the child and the parents are a triangle. And so the play therapist actually serves as the guide rails for not only the child's growth and healing, but the parent's understanding and awareness of best ways to interact with the child. And then obviously through the use of play, which is the way a child naturally processes the world. So we can't expect a child to communicate with us verbally to build relationships. We have to meet them and their emotions, which is where the play comes in. That's really interesting. Um, And what is a common frustration that parents have expressed when first trying to achieve a positive relationship through play therapy? I think a lot of times it's just discomfort because you have to learn a whole new way of interacting with kids. You learn new verbal skills, you learn new principles and tools. And so it's just new and new is sometimes awkward. Right. And so I think that's a normal frustration. But then I think another layer of that is parents not understanding child development mm-hmm. and not understanding what's age appropriate. And so if we start with the idea that kids are not rational and don't have abstract reasoning and can't verbally process the world, that is automatically a barrier for parents relating to their children because we expect kids to come to the cognitive side of life but we actually have to do the alternative, which has come to the emotional side. So I think that disconnect sometimes is a frustration as well. Even in the midst of learning a new skill, it's tricky because we forget that kids can't meet us where we are. It has to be the opposite. Right. It sounds like trying to learn a whole new language, like there's a language barrier there, except that children can't be expected to learn our language at their age. Um, So that's a great preface to our topic for the day. But before we get further into detail, we'd love to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Brenna? So my first question for you is, what is your most current read? Oh boy. Okay. So this puts me in a unique group of people I know, but my favorite books to read, movies to consume, documentaries, whatever, is World War II and the Holocaust. So I'm actually reading right now It's called The Man Who Broke Into Auschwitz, and it's based on a true story of a man who wanted to get into the concentration camp to see what was going on if the rumors were true, and he found a way to break in. So it's a little bit autobiographical, but also 
documentary based on a true story. But if I can get my hands on anything from that period in time, I, I love it. I find stories like that so incredible as well. But how do you find the balance between, because these stories tend to be very dark and thought provoking. So how do you find the balance between like things that are so dark and thought provoking and, and then, and then what, like what do you consume to relax or is this relaxing for you to think about? <laughs> I know. I have so many people say, that's really macabre. Why do you read stuff like that? I think I, I do. Here's my balance anyway. I don't know if others would agree, but I think my balance is that period of time and that part of history, I think it shows the best and worst of humanity. And I think I can always find the balance even in those sad, dark, deep stories it's the people that were working in the underground and the people that were helping and supporting and and doing what they could. And sometimes, you know, it was just like one family at a time that was served or helped or assisted. But, you know, that makes a big difference to those people. And so I feel like it's just kind of a balance in you question how something like that can happen, but then you see the good that was present at the same time. So for me, I kind of am able to work that out. <laughs> That's such an interesting and unique perspective, I must say. Um, do you have a favorite movie? Is it about the Holocaust as well? Probably not. I have so many good <laughs> movies, but I would say, I think this is just my bet. Now that I'm ready to say this, people are going to be like, oh my <laughs> word, she's so crazy. But I really love a good tragedy. And so <gasps> yeah. that those are my favorite genres of movies, I think, some kind of movie that involves a tragedy of sorts. So Legends of the Fall is certainly up there. That's a great one. That's from a long time ago, but a really good one. And I actually just recently watched Me Before You, and oh, that's yeah. a great one. Really sad, but really good. <laughs> so yeah, I tend to be on that side of I like a good tragedy too. So. <laughs> I love that. I mean, like sometimes you watch a tragedy come back to life and like life is pretty light and okay and you know that brings out the the good parts of life sometimes so i totally I understand so. that yeah. um are you listening to any podcasts at the moment interesting i'm a podcaster but i'm not a huge podcast listener so i really only listen to one and it's actually about group practitioners and so i run a therapy center with a staff and so every once in a blue moon, I'll listen to that just because it supports what I do clinically. But I, I tend to be the one behind the mic, not listening to it. <laughs> well, what's your biggest takeaway from that podcast that you're listening to? That we can't succeed in isolation. Mm -hmm. That has been a really huge revelation for me. And I think the need for community, the need for support, the need for like-minded people that have already been where I am or are working to be where I want to be. I think feeling that support and connection has been really helpful. Completely. We are social creatures at our core. Um, so that makes total sense. Do you have a role model either professionally or personally? Hmm. Okay. Can I do both? <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, personally, my grandmother um, I actually just lost her exactly three years ago this month, but um, such a strong, wise, gritty, determined woman. And she just, she inspired me in so many ways. And yeah, she's for sure my personal role model. Professionally, Gary Landreth is known as the godfather of the child-centered play therapy space. And so everything he's ever trained, created, written, put out, it's just, it's gold. And mm -hmm. it's, he really pioneered the application of the child-centered play therapy approach. And so, you know, I mean, it was passed down through history, through different teachers and different approaches, but he kind of made it accessible and started training it in the universities and really just blazed a trail for all of us. So Gary Landreth for sure, professionally. Those two sound like beautiful role models. And I'm really sorry to hear that your grandmother has passed away three months ago. Um, she sounds like a fantastic woman. Um, and my last question for you is, is there a course that has inspired you? Is there a course? Yeah, a course that you've taken in your lifetime, be it like educational or for your career. 
Yes. So I'm a huge Brendan Burchard fan. And so he originally, I mean, he's written several books. I mean, you know, Millionaire Messenger and Life's Golden Ticket. And so you have a lot of the books that he's written, but he created a course called Experts Academy. And that really transformed my vision of where I was going to go professionally. Not that it changed my play therapy path because that's always been very steady and solid, but it opened my eyes to the different avenues that I could take my knowledge. And so the author, the speaker, the expert, that really kind of, I guess, exposed me to new ideas of remaining child-centered and, and driven by play therapy, but then taking it into different channels. <laughs> so Experts Academy was a huge course. I loved it. I benefited greatly from it. And a lot of the stuff that he has put out has just been really influential for me in my career. That sounds great and so eye-opening for you. So that's very nice. Um, thank you so much for answering my questions. Uh, I feel sure. like we got to know you a bit better. Now we're moving on to the interview section. And my first question for you is, what do you think parenting is? What is your definition of parenting? It can differ from person to person. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. And you're right. There's there's no hard and fast answer. And I don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong either. But I think for me, especially as a mom myself, but then also because I've been working with parents for almost 20 years, my working definition, I suppose, is it's the responsibility and the task that we chose when we had children. Yeah. And I think often we we lament the frustrations and we get frustrated by the struggles. And, you know, sometimes we complain about how hard it is. And one of the phrases I hear all the time is, you know, you have to get a, you have to go through a course to drive and you have to do all of these, you know, training requirements for everything else in life except parenting. And while that's true, I also think that the moment that we chose to become parents, it became our job. And therefore it can't be something that frustrates us or that we resent or, you know, complain about because quite frankly, it's something that we signed up for. Mm -hmm. And that's why, it's our task at that point to educate ourselves, equip ourselves, train, do everything we can to be the best parents that we can be. But operationally speaking, I mean, I think that's big picture definition, but then operationally, I think it's realizing that our kids are small beings mm -hmm. and they deserve kindness and love and respect and all of the things that we would extend to other adults in our lives we can't treat kids any less just because they're small. And I think that gets missed a lot. And so I think parenting really is intentionality about being kind and loving and respectful to our kids because we want happy kids who become happy adults. And the only way that we create that is if we honor and nurture that relationship, even in their childhood and in their, those small years, that it's easy to disregard them or you know, kind of slough off while well, they're still too little, but really they are sponges and they're soaking everything up. So relationships are built on micro experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that as parents, if we nourish those micro experiences, that's parenting at its best. Absolutely. And you put in such an eloquent manner. So what do you think expectant parents need to be aware of in transition to parenthood? Hmm. Well, it's not going to be what you thought it was. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, there's always these idyllic visions of what, you know, raising a child's going to be, and it's never going to be that. But it is really an incredible gift. It is such a special thing. And, you know, when you, when you have a child and you know that they're going to someday be an adult and they're going to look back on you as their parent and have stories to tell, you know, that's something that I talk about all the time. We want to keep in mind what stories are our kids going to tell when they're 25 and someone asks them, what was your childhood like? What were your parents like? What do you remember about being little? Do we want them to say that we were kind, we were patient, we were gracious, we were forgiving, we owned our mistakes, we taught them, we were, you know, sympathetic. We, I mean, there's so many things that I think we ideally want our children to say but that should influence every moment. So instead of reacting and getting angry and yelling and getting frustrated and all the things that are easy to do, if there's purpose behind those decisions, because the goal is, I want my child to reflectively look back and say, 
My parents did everything they could to give me an amazing childhood. That's really powerful and that's a huge motivator. So I think, you know, transitioning into, I mean, obviously with a new baby, you know, there's there's a huge learning curve, but with children in general still living in the home, you know, there there needs to be a lot of thought into what kind of relationship you're creating, what kind of interactions you have, the nature of the conversations that you cherish in the relationship. So it's definitely a lot of work to be purposeful. And I think that expectant parents, if they go into it with every moment that I have, I can choose to create something that I want or just allow the default. And usually the default is not ideal. Mm -hmm. So I think that choice is very empowering for parents. Yeah, those are some incredibly wise words. Uh, But with regards to play therapy, can you Give us an overview of what it is and how it's used in the context of parent-child relationships. Sure. So parent-child interactions are usually strained if parents don't understand the developmental level of kids. So play serves as the conduit, if you will, so that the child will naturally be in their developmentally appropriate stage They will be in their emotions and they will play out experiences and what happens to them in the world naturally. If you give a child, any child anywhere in the world, if you give them 15 minutes of unsupervised time, they will find something to play with. It is miraculous to watch. You can test the theory, you know, like give them a room with, you know, whatever they can find in it, they will find something to play with. So they're naturally wired to experience the world, test things out, work through situations, problem solve. They do all of these things through their play. It's just naturally intrinsic. So if parents can recognize that and meet the child in their play, that actually helps build the relationship. And then the play therapy approach has all of these verbal connections that take place while the child is playing, which I think you're going to ask about in a little bit. So I'll save that for then. But there's definitely the sense of not only are we meeting the child in their play, which is relationally connective, but then we learn ways to interact with the child while they're playing so that it actually does even more for them than just the play in and of itself. And so how does play therapy differ from other traditional forms of therapy and why is it particularly suited for children? Right, that's a helpful question. So. If we recognize that children don't develop abstract reasoning skills until about the age of 13, obviously girls develop a little faster than boys. So sometimes for girls it's 12, but typically 13 is kind of the standard age when we see abstract reasoning develop. And we also recognize that kids are not verbal, they're not rational, they're not cognitive. So traditional forms of therapy require all of those components. You have to be able to talk, you have to be able to cognitively process, You have to be able to answer questions. You have to sit and have prompts and dialogue. And kids are just not wired for any of those interactions. So traditional therapy is very well suited for teenagers and older, but it is not developmentally appropriate for kids. So play therapy is really well suited for kids three to 13. And it meets them in their emotional process and it meets them in their lack of verbal capacity and lack of abstract reasoning because a traditional therapist might say, tell me why you felt that way or tell me why you did that or what were you thinking or feeling at that moment? And you can test this theory too. It's actually fun because you get the exact same response. If you ask a child any of those questions, they either give you a one word answer or they say, I don't know. And that's very frustrating for an adult, but the irony is that's a truthful response. They don't know because they didn't think about anything. They are emotionally driven. They are here and now in the moment, whatever feeling I'm feeling inside dictates my behavior. So they felt and they did. There was never a cognitive process. So therefore, when someone says, why did you do that? And they go, I don't know. And then, you know, usually adults go, what do you mean you don't know? And then it becomes this big fight. But the reality is the child literally doesn't know because there was never a thought involved. So the way that I describe this so that parents really can grasp this concept, if you're familiar with pool pumps or air conditioning units, anything that has a float switch. So there is a a level within a liquid container that when the liquid hits the container, the switch is tripped. That's basically the function of a float switch. So 
if you think about kids and they are always in this emotional pot, well, the level of the water is going to rise and fall based on how big their feelings get and what's going on emotionally for them. Well, when the feelings rise to a certain level in the pot, the float switch gets tripped and it literally says to the child, your brain can go take a break. <laughs> so the brain completely shuts off. It disappears. It has its little siesta. The child is consumed by feelings. All they do is act out in their emotions. And then once the emotions de-escalate again, the float switch gets tripped again. And then the brain comes back in and the brain goes, what did you do that for? You shouldn't have yelled. You shouldn't have thrown that. You shouldn't have said those things. You know better. But the brain was not involved in the decision making process. It was shut off. So parents only see behaviors and they only see emotionally driven responses and they can't fathom why a kid does something. But the reality is they don't know. So until they hit that 13 year old threshold, the only way for them to rehearse and learn and grow and understand regulation and understand self-control and understand what's appropriate and what isn't is through playing situations out because the playing lets them stay in their emotions and it never forces them up into their head. Because essentially what happens is the brain and the heart have to war with each other in a child. Yeah. So the heart will always win. Mm -hmm. So if we give them the space to play, they can stay in their heart and then we meet them there, which is much more effective than trying to have them come and function through the brain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the analogy that you used. Um, but what are some of the fundamental principles or techniques used in play therapy? So at its core, it is that we believe that children naturally understand what they're struggling with. They naturally understand their shortcomings, their mistakes, their failures, their issues, their problems, whatever it is that they really don't execute well, they inherently understand those things. We really have to start there because everything else flows from the idea that kids want to be the best version of themselves that they can be. And that really is the beauty of kids. It's the beauty of childhood and their innocence. No child chooses to stay in a dysregulated state if they can help it. So when you have parents that say, oh my gosh, my kid has meltdown six times a day and they're always having a tantrum and it's impossible to take them anywhere. What is often missed is no child wants to be in that state. They're not choosing to stay there. They're not willingly wanting that. They don't know how to get themselves out of it. So if we understand that they will naturally work toward being a better version of themselves if given the time, the tools and the opportunity, then we take that and say, okay, so then we need a relationship in which the child feels safe enough to work on these things. We need someone to serve as therapeutic guide rails, saying appropriate things at appropriate times so that it kind of keeps the child going in the right direction, which can be a parent, but it's usually also a play therapist. And then we provide them with the tools. So they need toys to play out any scenario that they need to work through so that they can either rewrite their story, they can create a new narrative, they can desensitize their, their feelings when they're too big. They just work through what they need to work through, but the time, the tools, and the opportunity have to all come together. So the principles then are how parents and therapists interact, and those are very skill-based, intentional phrases and we interact verbally while the child is playing. The child never has to say anything if they don't want to, but the parent or the therapist are very verbally actively engaged using those principles. So could you share some examples of the types of activities and interventions used in these play therapy sessions? So we act as a child-centered, let me, let me preface. So there are different types of play therapy. So there are directive approaches and there are non-directive approaches. I am a child-centered play therapist, so we are very non-directive. And essentially what that means is we trust the child to do the work that they need to do in the child's way and in the child's time. So we actually would never introduce an activity or an intervention because that's the non-directive model. There are directive models that if a child is struggling with aggression, for example, a therapist might have them do an activity related to aggression so that they can process it. But 
I'm on the very non-directive side. So <laughs> I will answer the question in a different way though. So what will happen in the playroom is the child will start to work on power and control themes, let's say. And so we immediately recognize, okay, the child has felt powerless. The child has felt out of control. So now in the playroom, they're taking ultimate authority, ultimate power and control so that the pendulum swings to the other side. So they have felt stuck on one side, powerless. Now they're going to have ultimate power. And then eventually they realize neither side is healthy. Neither side is where they want to be. And then they find centered balance. So as we watch this unfold, we are trained to reflect their feeling, for example. We're trained to use choice giving. We're trained to set limits in a specific way if necessary. We're trained to use encouragement. So we have these skills that serve as the undergirding for as we recognize what the child is working on, then we use the skills appropriate for that issue so that it helps the child process what they need. So what is the directive approach like and what is the main distinction there? Is there is is one better than the other or um, are there different situations where maybe the directive approach might be better? So that is the age old debate. And <laughs> there are people on both sides of the fence and never the twain shall meet, I don't think so. <laughs> There, there are people who are vehemently opposed to the non-directive approach, and then the polar opposite is true as well. Yeah. So in my work, I have only ever been child-centered and non-directive. I have been trained in that way. I have seen that, in my opinion, it is the best approach, <laughs> because if we inherently believe that kids want to be the best version of themselves that they can be, why do we need to step in and force them to address something before they're ready? Why do we need to direct an activity when they may want to work on something else first? If we just give kids the environment, the relationship and the tools, they will address what they need to. So I don't ever like taking the reins from a child because I believe that the child is fully capable of handling that for their own way, their own time, their own pace. However, the directive approaches are more driven by the cognitive model. And so, for example, you know, you can have cognitive behavioral therapy for kids, even though that's not empirically supported, they're not cognitive. So doing a cognitive approach doesn't make much sense in my opinion, but there are child versions of CBT. And I think the directive model would be more along the lines of a CBT approach. So it would be if your child is not handling their emotions, let's play some games and look at feeling charts and look at feeling faces and let's better identify feelings, which would probably work to a degree. But the non-directive model says kids will naturally figure that out and work through that on their own. And I believe that when someone takes ownership and responsibility of their own change and their own healing and their own growth, it's more longstanding, the outcomes are better, the gains stay longer. I mean, I can force someone to learn something, but is it actually going to stick and have long reaching effects? I think it's much more effective when the child comes to those conclusions on their own. And what are some signs or indicators that parents should look for in order to determine if play therapy might be beneficial for their child? So I'll start with the data and then I'll share some personal examples. So the data shows that play therapy is beneficial for all ages, and that even includes adults, ironically. So they've done many, many studies with the geriatric population. They've done studies with adults of all issues at all age ranges. So play therapy is just helpful because the older we get, the less we play. And we, we should play. We were meant to be playful beings, and we need to play more. So there's a lot of really healthy things that come out of playing at any age. But they have done all kinds of studies that show not only is it helpful at any age, it's helpful for every issue. It's helpful with every ethnicity, with every culture, with race, with it doesn't matter why the child comes in. It doesn't matter the child's background. Play therapy is regulating. Um, so what are some signs or indicators that parents should look for in order to determine if play therapy might be beneficial for their child? 
That's a helpful question. So I'll give the data side first and then I'll share the personal because I think both are relevant. So they have done all kinds of studies. They've been studying play therapy for decades. We have 60 to 70 years of research. So they have shown it effective with all ages, including geriatrics, including people that have traumatic brain injuries with aphasia, with apraxia, it doesn't really matter. Any kind of issue that would make play appropriate in lieu of talking, they found it extremely effective. But even specifically to childhood populations, they have found it effective with all presenting issues, with all backgrounds, with all races, cultures, ethnicities. ethnicities. It is really well suited for any issue. And I think the reason why is because we are wired to be playful beings mm -hmm. and we're able to dive deeper into our feelings when we're playing than if we're talking. And mm -hmm. so when you give a child an environment that lets them work on whatever it is that comes into mind, there's a freedom in that and it's really helpful. And then we have four universal outcomes. So whether a parent says, I really want to be proactive and I just think play therapy would be helpful for my child because there will be beneficial gains regardless of any issues. Or you have the reactive parents that say, oh my gosh, like kids, my kid is really having a hard time and we're really struggling. So I think play therapy would be helpful, which are kind of both sides of the <laughs> spectrum. You have four universal outcomes. So play therapy provides an increase in regulation. That's across the board for all issues. So they just become more regulated in every scenario, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, physically. They just regulate better. So that's one universal outcome. The second is increased worldview. So they are actually able to look at a situation and say, if I do X, there are going to be outcomes outside of this moment. So this will impact other people, this will impact me, this will impact the future, this will impact this scenario. So worldview expands because before play therapy, they're very here and now I focused. Mm -hmm. Developmentally appropriately so, but they only care about themselves in that moment. Mm -hmm. Worldview helps them to see that there are other people and other scenarios impacted by their choices. Third is increased self-esteem, which we all should be working on our sense of self throughout our whole lifetime. So to have a child work on self-esteem at a young age, it only sets themselves up for success in the future. And then increased emotional vocabulary. And there are plenty of adults in the world that do not have an emotional IQ. They do not have an emotional vocabulary. So whether it's a reactive or a proactive approach, those are the four universal outcomes that kids will achieve just by participating in play therapy. <laughs> So I would say it's pretty universally well received. And then, you know, to have watched kids come in to my center and go through a process of play therapy, they really transform into the best version of themselves. And so when you have kids who come in and they're quiet and they're timid or they're angry or they're withdrawn or they're whatever, and then you see them leave and they've transformed literally before your eyes, it's the power and the beauty of play therapy. That sounds a lot like um, art therapy and its effects as well. Is there a connection there? We get asked a lot when I say I'm a play therapist, one of the common questions is, oh, like music and art therapy? So I think there's a big association for those therapies. They all are kind of within the same realm of <laughs> you do an activity to ground yourself, to heal, to discover about yourself. So while we don't use, well, a child is able to choose to do any kind of art in the playroom, but we don't have any kind of art therapy prompts as far as what we do. Mm -hmm. But I think it definitely has a similar outcome mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't know what our subconscious needs, but as we let it come out through different mediums, we are able to sort through things. And I think art and play both do that. Yeah. Um, and are there any misconceptions or myths about play therapy in parent-child relationships? So many, but I'll, I'll <laughs> highlight the main one. Yeah. I think the biggest misconception is that play therapy is just playing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, parents will say, well, why can't my kid just play at home and get better? Or why can't I just play with my kid and why won't that work? Yeah. So what's the and, distinction there? Well, 
a child will naturally play, but a child doesn't have therapeutic guide rails without someone that understands what's happening and why it's significant and appropriate ways to verbally interact and respond. Mm -hmm. So if a child went through, let's say, a traumatic medical experience, for example. They were hospitalized and it was really overwhelming and it was really scary and now they have a fear of doctors or hospitals or whatever medically happened. They will inevitably play out either the exact same situation or a similar situation. They may not play out going to a hospital, but they'll play out a car accident or they'll play out a drowning or some other really overwhelming and emotional kind of scenario. And they'll play it out over and over and over again. But the nature of playing it out can only get them to a certain threshold. They need someone that's reflecting their feeling and encouraging and helping them understand what's going on. So the verbal interaction with an adult, remember, they're not cognitive, they're not rational. So an adult has both sides. The adult can have the emotional connection, but then also the rational. So th that becomes the bridge, if you will. So the interaction with the parent or with the therapist serves as that gap bridge. So, hey, like kid is stuck over here in emotions. I can see both sides. So what I say is going to actually help your head and your heart come together and make sense of this for you. Yeah. And what are some of the potential challenges or limitations of play therapy? Could you take us through some of it and how they can be addressed? So often when parents start to use play therapy skills, kids aren't used to that kind of language and they're not used to that kind of approach. So sometimes kids ask questions and get frustrated and like, why are you talking funny? And why are you saying weird things? And why are you telling me how I feel? So there can be a little bit of frustration on both ends because new is different and new normal is hard to adjust to. So I think one of the, the consistent frustrations is just that it takes some time on both sides for the child and the parent to feel comfortable with the parent being involved in their play and using specific words and phrases and skills and things like that, just because neither is used to that. Mm -hmm. And then I think one of the other limitations, I don't know that I would say it's a limitation, but I think a frustration is that sometimes to think about the amount of time that you're going to have to sit and play with your child for this to truly be effective. You know, we're looking at a national average of 30 play sessions before a child can really oh, wow. resolve the things yeah. that they need to work through. So that's a pretty big time commitment for a parent to say, I'm going to be intentional about a weekly play time with my child, and it's going to take me half a year mm -hmm. to get through 30 sessions. And so it's really about the commitment and the investment that needs to be made for it to really see the full potential. Yeah. Um, and when do you think is the optimum time for parents to introduce play therapy um, into the child's life? Really as early as possible, I have trained parents to use play therapy language with their kids in infancy. I think that's invaluable because your baby is actually your practice ground mm -hmm. because they can't talk back to you yet. So mm -hmm. you can get it wrong a hundred times and yeah. they don't know, but it's actually a practice yeah. for you to get used to the language and the phrases and the words. But developmentally, kids are really well suited for play sessions and the play therapy approach starting around three. Mm -hmm. So I encourage parents in infancy to use it just in the way that they communicate with their baby, but then actually start playing actively with the child around three. Mm -hmm. And how can parents ensure that they maintain these positive changes and insights gained through play therapy throughout the entire year, rather than just starting with it and kind of dropping off after a while? That, that really is a struggle. It's, it's very difficult to do something consistently. And the play approach is that ideally the best schedule is a once a week playtime. Mm -hmm. And so a child does really well and handles that schedule well. It's not overwhelming on either side. You know, you can pencil in a 45 minute playtime once a week and that doesn't seem like an overly burdensome commitment. So what what we encourage, we have a, a parent coaching program that we do, and what we encourage them is you set aside the same time, same day each week, 
and it just becomes your playtime. And it becomes something that is scheduled and intentional and consistent. And you would treat it as a trip to the gym or a trip to band practice or soccer practice. Like if your kid has soccer practice on Tuesdays, you go on Tuesday, whether you want to or not. You have a play session on Friday afternoon, whether you want to or not, because it's part of the schedule and the routine. And when you do it long enough and when you're consistent with it, both the parent and the child really begin to look forward to it. And it no longer seems like something that they have to do as an obligation. It's something that they both look forward to and want to do because they see the value in the time spent together. That's such great advice. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. You gave such comprehensive answers. And I feel like we got um, to get this amazing in-depth insights into play therapy. Um, so now moving on to the open mic section, and this is your chance to talk about anything that you're passionate about that doesn't have to be related to the topic. So take it away. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start with one of my greatest loves, which is baseball. So we are a huge baseball family and that is actually a very interesting dynamic because mm -hmm. our son's been playing baseball since he was three. And I'm always, always, always around parents with kids because he plays on baseball teams, which is yeah. parents with children. So yeah. I feel like it's really helpful for me to to see both sides because obviously, you know, I'm a play therapist and it's what I do. It's what I know. It's how I operate. I've been using play therapy principles with our son since he was born and he's newly 14. So, you know, he has only ever known play therapy as a parenting approach. And it's interesting when I'm around parents that really have no awareness of the play therapy approach. And I, I just love, I love baseball families. They're the best families, but it's so fascinating to watch parents. And I really do feel that play therapy provides this unique solution that I think a lot of parents don't even know that they're looking for, which is a framework for how to best interact with your kids. And so you know, I have several podcasts. One is specifically for parents and it's a parenting approach from the play therapy perspective. And I think that if parents can wrap their head around, I only want to do one thing, right? Because we can read books and we can listen to podcasts and we can get all of this knowledge and acquire all of this information. But then we're always ever just throwing a noodle at the wall and seeing what will stick in any given moment, right? So like, oh, my kid's screaming at me, let me try this. And now my kid won't go to bed, let me try this. And it's this hodgepodge disaster of burden and pressure and frustration that it's my job as a parent to try to solve this problem in this moment. And, you know, ironically, we only ever parent the way we were parented <laughs> or we say, I will never ever parent like my parents did because I hated it. But then you're left scrambling to figure out a different approach, which leaves you feeling lacking in confidence and really clueless. So in either scenario, you're stuck. And one of the things that I talk about a lot is a parenting prison. So when you find yourself in a parenting prison, which means you have a limited set of options, the key to get you out of that is one single-handed trusted source and framework and I feel like the play therapy model is that because from A to Z, you know exactly how to respond, what to do, what your systems are, what your phrases are. It's a very comprehensive package mm -hmm. and it's applicable in any situation. So, you know, we're at the ball fields and there's a little two year old sister that comes along to the games and, you know, she's kind of like passed around from parent to parent because her mom doesn't want to chase her all over the ballpark. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing when I sit down and I do play therapy with her, I can see the connection. I can see the investment. I can see the relationship forming. And, you know, her mom is like, she doesn't sit on anyone's lap for that long. I have no idea how she's sitting with you. And, you know, I like, I'm sure people are like, wow, Brenna has this like magic touch, but it's play therapy. That's <laughs> what it is. And so the magic of it is, you have this system and this foundation of knowledge and you don't have to deviate. You don't have to scramble. You don't have to try to figure something out. You always fall back on this wealth of information that is play therapy. And so, you know, b baseball has kind of given me that other side of the coin to see things from a different perspective because clinically, you know, my clients, I work with them and I, I know what that looks like because it's an isolated environment. 
But out in the real world, you know, we go to restaurants, we go to ball games, we go wherever, and you see parents and kids, and you can just see the tension and the frustration and the angst and the, you know, the negative vibe. And I just wish that parents could trust one source. And that's why I evangelize play therapy so much. Yeah, that's a really, really great story. And I love the the idea of kids in like little sports uniforms and just playing sport and it's just so adorable as well. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. If our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Sure. So my parenting podcast is playtherapyparenting.com. And that has been about seven or so years in in the running. So there's a lot of episodes there. And again, it's through the lens of child-centered play therapy. So sometimes it's topical, but it is always related to the play therapy approach, regardless of whether it's more of a skill training or a topical discussion or something like that. And then, you know, I would really encourage parents not specifically to look for something from me, but if they want to read a really good book, The Art of the Relationship by Gary Landreth is a a wealth of information. It's just covered in gold. So that really will help parents understand the framework is always the relationship and everything flows out of that, which is what child-centered play therapy is all about too. But even from the parenting side of it, you know, you focus on the relationship and kids will behave in more self-enhancing ways. If you focus on the problems, they'll behave in more self-defeating ways. So the art of the relationship is fantastic. And I talk a lot about that book in my podcast. And a lot of the content that I train comes from Gary Landris content there. So the podcast would be a really helpful resource. And then that book as well. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brenna, for joining us today. Uh, Playtherapyparenting.com. We'll link that in the show notes along with The Art of Relationship by Gary. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Have a very happy new year and we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast, produced by the Parenting Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Measurement Science Labs, More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so that we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pa.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent. Thanks for tuning in.